bit about who you are, what you do now, and also where it all began for you, please. So um, I'm currently at a school in Watford near, um, near the Harry Potter Studios, very magical. Um, and I am currently teaching year five and I'm the curriculum lead at our school. This is my third year at the school. Um, actually very much like Ian, I started in secondary. Um, I've been in primary now for 10 years, but I started in secondary as a PE teacher. Um, I vividly remember my um, NQT year, mainly because my NQT mentor um, has just retired. And I remember, and it's the one thing I would say for any NQT is make sure that you've got someone that's really supportive. And if you could have someone that's as supportive of you as I had from um, Daryl Chapman, who supported me, then you'd be going great guns. The benefit of being a secondary PE teacher was we could actually do team teaching and paired lessons, which obviously in a classroom based setting you can't do. Um, my NQT year for primary, as I say, was 10 years ago when I started teaching at an independent school. Um, and I started as a year four teacher and I've taught all through um, key stage two across a range of primary schools now um, and teaching, as I say, at a school now in, teaching in year five and leading on the curriculum. But that's my journey, really. Lovely. Thank you, Mark. I look forward to hearing more about you at the, at the, at the sharp end and how you've been dealing with it. And also how and the conversations we had during lockdown about the and since the curriculum that you had and how it the, the way that you work with your children before lockdown, before the pandemic is actually allowed them to have a better transition into this pandemic and, and beyond so we can talk about that and we'll touch on that with Jonathan as well I'll come to Jonathan next another another gentleman at the sharp end although currently at the blunt end because he's having a bit of a time, bit of time off up in the northeast and um, so where did it all begin for you where did, where did it go wrong Jonathan where did it go right <laughs> <clears throat> so I am a teacher, a uh, deputy head at St. Catherine's uh, Primary School in Sheffield and um, that is it's the only school that I've ever worked at actually. I've been there 22 years now this year I think. So I started as an NQT uh, as a year one teacher uh, and then got uh, moved uh, completely against my will uh, into year six after a couple of years um, and then got stuck there for about 15 years or so uh, and I've done various things became an advanced skills teacher at one point when they existed uh, and then kind of largely because I just wanted to stay teaching kids uh, I suppose for as long as possible um, and then kind of finally became deputy head uh, where I'm in charge of curriculum uh, teaching and learning basically uh, which is fantastic um, and again because I've stayed in the same place I, I still have kind of really vivid memories of my NQT year, uh, the, the, the classroom that I was in. Um, it was a year one classroom, it's now like a year four classroom, but um, just being in the room brings those memories. Um, and more than anything else, it was that sense of just being completely overwhelmed by it. Because um, when you're training, I did like a three year course at uh, Sheffield Hallam University, which is not even a proper university, but I got my degree. And, uh, and basically in teaching, when you do your teacher practice, it's just, like you're pretending, it's just, you're pretending and you do a bit of teaching and then you go and have a break back at university where you put your feet up. When I started my NQT, it was like, Christ, this is my life. This is, this is like, it's nonstop. And there's just stuff that swamped me that I'd not fully considered. Um, and it was just hard. And I think my overriding feeling as an NQT was just a, like a desperation to get through my first year without like physically harming kids. Do you know what I mean? I think if you get that under your belt, that's the issue with kind of levels of expectation sometimes that we set ourselves, you know, the, we set the bar for ourselves really, really high. And I did, and I, I looked at these other colleagues working alongside me who just seemed to be doing stuff effortlessly, uh, coping with everything. Um, and I thought, bloody hell, I, I don't know whether I can operate at that level. Um, and then I found out their secret. Um, they weren't. Um, they might have appeared to have been doing everything, but these people I looked up to, these phenomenal teachers, no one was able to do everything. Um, and that discovery was just a, a quite a moment in my career. It's like a weight lifted. Um, actually, nobody does everything brilliantly. Um, and so you just have to focus on the stuff that matters the most and just do really well at that stuff and not worry about the, the whole, um, if you like. So there you go. That was kind of my, that's the thing that kept me in teaching, if you like. Yeah. Uh, it, we did a similar session yesterday with some different associates of Nina was there and we, it, for secondary NQTs and that sort of came through this idea that actually the best teachers in the world, the most accomplished, the ones who just you think are effortless, they, they have their crap days. They have their yeah. lessons that went really, really badly, whether they'll admit it or not are two different things, but everybody does. It's just the nature of the job. So yeah. there's, there's, no, there's, no, there's no perfect home run with all, all this, not a perfect score. 
And 20 years you've been at that point. You, you, I didn't know that you could start teaching at the age of 12. That was, I'm impressed with that. <laughs> <laughs> Just, I use a lot of moisturizer. You retain your youthful, talking of youthful good looks. Um, the reason Jonathan is uh, one of our associates because um, Will Ryan, who was a, another of our associates prior to Jonathan, saw Jonathan teaching and said, this is the best thing I've ever seen. You must uh, make contact with this guy and, and have him as one of our associates. So um, uh, Will Ryan, tell us about where, where it all began for you, please. Uh, did I really say that about Jonathan? Uh, excellent. Uh, you, well, you may be in Rotterdam, I'm in Rotherham. Uh, and greetings. Uh, and can I just add my congratulations to the NQTs out there. This period between September to October is the hardest half term in any year, and especially this year. So congratulations. Uh, I had a, I'm very old. Um, I started in 1974. They hadn't even invented NQTs in 1974. Uh, I, I was a, a probationary teacher. I had a stroke of luck. They offered me a job in Rotherham. Uh, and it was a stroke of luck. I wanted a job in Sheffield because I thought I was a big city boy. Uh, but I, I, they sent me to Rotherham. And uh, I, I've got a souvenir of my NQT year. Uh, it, it's uh, a miner's lamp. I don't know if you can see it. Uh, on the second day, a child gave it me and said, my granddad doesn't want this anymore. You can have it. Uh, and uh, it's, it served me well. Over 47 years, about 30 ch children a year have sketched that miner's lamp at some stage. Um, I started in Rotherham uh, in a village called Greensborough. Uh, it was a community built around iron and steel. The parents worked three shifts a day, mornings, afters and nights. Uh, the school where I uh, was working prior uh, to me arriving up until the April had been in the old West Riding of Yorkshire rather than Rotherham. Now the West Riding had got a brilliant tradition set up by a man called Sir Alec Clegg built around pupil creativity. He believed that all children could achieve. He believed in creating well-rounded citizens. Uh, and he thought that often the route to that was through crea creativity, through poetry, through music, through, through contemporary dance, through creative writing. And, and I suddenly found myself in this tremendous place. Now, the fact that I couldn't teach any of this stuff was irrelevant uh, because it, it, you know, the people who employed me, I think, knew I couldn't teach this stuff, but they knew I would be surrounded by it. Uh, the people who employed me had a belief in me. They believed I'd got potential. Now, since that time, I've probably had 10 significant jobs, including the job currently with you at Independent Thinking. And I think everybody who took me on saw potential. Uh, they had a belief in you. Uh, and that's what I, one of the messages I give to NQTs, uh, repay the belief that somebody has shown in you. I, I, I was sur surrounded by uh, some great people. Uh, Jonathan touched on them. Y yes, they may have been panicking underneath, but sometimes they'd got that kind of capacity of, of being the, the serene swan. Um, and uh, one of the things I'd say, I learned so much from other people. So. Pick your role models uh, as you go along. I certainly pick mine. Uh, and sometimes it's about walking in the, the footsteps of giants. I'll just say a little bit about the school I was at. It was an old Victorian building, but it was separate, separated. There's two buildings, an annex and the main building, separated by the main A6109. Uh, the class I inherited uh, had been in the annex for three years. They'd been in the annex because the head teacher did not like them. She was frightened of her. The, the, it, it, it was full of oddities, this particular class. Uh, I could tell you so much about the, the characters uh, within it. Um, they, they were challenging, there is no doubt about it. The head teacher didn't like them. They knew the head, the children knew the head teacher didn't like them. The parents knew that the head teacher didn't like this particular class. Uh, yet the class were desperate to be loved and, and they, they didn't know how to, to go about that. Uh, and I think one of the things I learned very, very early on uh, was you've got to teach the class you've got rather than the class you wish you had got. And sometimes that means getting underneath their skin and, and seeing what, 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 what makes them tick. Uh, and that was part of the challenge. And maybe that's where the miner's lamp comes in, but perhaps I better say a bit more about that later on. <laughs> Thank you. I like the fact that you're sitting there in the dark with a lamp. I think that absolutely. They probably had to light the thing. 
I, I can't, I've got every light. We're, we're, we're in tier three. We can't be burning lights. <laughs> Get that light out. <laughs> um, what's interesting there is you said you were uh, in the school and, and the industries were, it was, what did you say, coal and steel, I think? Coal and steel. Coal and steel. Predominantly coal. Yeah. So you, we've had that transition from towns and cities where there was a reason for it's too there's a reason for going to school because there are these jobs that we can get as opposed to there are no jobs therefore what's the point but the flip side of that is there i'm going to get a job anyway down the mine or in the, in the factory or uh therefore i don't need to concentrate on school so we could perhaps come back to that because yeah. i think there's both sides of that it, it was a, a very static community you were yeah. born in the village you stayed in the village you, and most likely you died in the village yeah yeah I mean, what, what, we well. could, what, what might come out later as well is also issues, which I know are issues in that part of the world around Brexit and other and migrants and that yep. side of thing. You know, yep. maybe, maybe if that's a, under the Q&A, that's something that people want to sort of touch on. How do we make sure that, it, that our, the children of, of, of the UK, if that's where most people are from on this, um, yep. uh, on this webinar, are global citizens and see themselves as part of the world and, not, and they're not closing down? I think that, that's... That might be something we could touch on. But from an, from an industry careers point of view, I'm really glad that David Hodgson is here. Who And that, as far as I'm aware, that's his sort of, that was his way. It was understanding people and connections and jobs. Um, uh, so just, yeah, David, sort of introduce yourself and, and where it all started for you, where you are now and, and join the dots. Yeah, well, good evening, everyone. I'm David Hodgson. I work um, with teachers in all phases and my background is from I'm from County Durham so similar to what Will said um, and I became a careers advisor and worked with young people initially in a in the 1980s and 90s when the, the weren't it was supposed to be the worst time ever to be a young person only now is support and now now is the uh, and there's this um, so how, how do we get children to raise their aspirations and so on that's the journey that i've been on for about 20 years so what interests me is how can we help everyone thrive and this is young people in school and, to, and when they're outside of school what do we need to do to support them and that's where i started but in in the last 20 or so years i've done a lot of work with teachers too looking at how can we make sure teachers thrive and one of the questions I, I am interested in is um, looking at what are the things that we all need to do to be successful um, in our life? Um, and then also, what are the things that are particular to us? And I've done a lot of, looked at a lot of the research around personality and the impact that can have. And I've worked a lot with teachers looking at their own personalities um, and there, there is a link, which I think Nina will put up, where if you want to, during this session, find out your own personality preferences, it only takes a couple of minutes, you'll come up with a profile, and then perhaps share that with, with us and see what we get uh, tonight. And one simple way to describe the importance of personality is, you know, the phrase, you don't need to make a song and dance about it. Um, well, actually, some people do need to make a song and dance about it, and that's children and teachers. That's how they can be their best. But and then there are equally a, a whole range of young people and teachers that don't want to make a song and dance about it. They need to become brilliant in a different way. And those are the kinds of areas that I'm interested in to make sure that we can be comfortable with working out what our best is. There's not an identikit way to be brilliant at what we do. It, we've got to find a, a way to be confident in using our natural strengths and talents. Okay, thank you, David. There's, there's been in education in the 26 years since I said of independent thinking, um, there's been a, a sort of a reductionism in terms of this is what children are, this is how they learn, this, they're, they're like this. We know that, you know, this is the nature. So we forget learning styles, forget different intelligences, forget personal learning, thinking skills, forget all that sort of stuff. This is it. This is what children need. And 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 there's a place for, yeah, these are the certain principles that mean that children will learn stuff, but there's also much more than that. And if we just reduce it down to putting facts into individuals' heads without even thinking of them as individuals, we 
we do, we do at the world of education a huge disservice. We might get some better SATS results, and we'll perhaps touch on that in a little while because there's lots of ways, there's always another way, which is a phrase we keep coming to with independent thinking. But education has got to be so much more than that. And I like the work that you've done, David, around what is it that good teachers do? That is, there are some generalities, but there's also some particulars and, uh, uh, and how that works. And, and, and the, you're allowed to have a personality. Yeah. Uh, you know, all this don't yeah. start till Christmas rubbish. Actually, it's uh, one of the things that got me through my first term as NQT was the, the amount to which I smiled and had a laugh and refused to shout and refused to get cross. That, yeah. was, that was a vital part of my survival. So, okay, we look forward to hearing more about that. I think Nina might have put that, that, that link in as well. Which brings us to the lovely ninja lurking in mysterious ways in the chat room. So Nina, tell us where, tell us where it all began to do and what you're doing now and, 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 and what happened in between. Well, where it all began was this passion and this innate need to help children because I had a very difficult upbringing and I didn't want children to be suffering the same things that I'd suffered. And I'd always found that music was an amazing, wonderful world for me. It took me to some magical places. So I, um, before I became a teacher, I was actually a, um, an opera singer and I did music uh, therapy as well. And um, then I went to train to become a teacher with some amazing people. The first ever music PGC at um, East Sussex University. So I ha ended up having a job in Gosport um, in a school. And as an NQT, I went in as a head of department. <laughs> and nobody had even told me during my NQT year that you needed to even make these things called schemes of work. But I had a brilliant, brilliant mentor, a Glynis Alexander, who was, an, who was the head of art and the senior leader there. And she told me to trust in what I believed in that was right for the children. And, you know, as you will know from my book, The Little Book of Music for the Classroom, how music literally transformed not just the quality of the music curriculum, but also the well being and enveloping individuals for who and what they are. And this piece of music that, that changed my life as a teacher, because I had difficulties with behavior in my first term. And I swear to you, I just thought that's it, I'm going to have to leave because I am rubbish. I couldn't manage some of my classes. They were so, so challenging. And in this particular school, we had 69% of students on what was the EBD register. And, you know, we had fights in the school and one of the children in my class uh, shot another kid. And then uh, one of the, the children actually went and sort of punched the head teacher in the nose. And we had, uh, I had to become an appropriate adult. I didn't know any of this. And for me, actually being thrown into what was like a big lion's den was the most wonderful experience I have ever, ever had. And I guess if I take those experiences, which were very, very challenging, I had to be resilient, I had to be creative, I had to be very, very disciplined with myself, despite my brain sort of going everywhere and wanted to change the world. But what those young people did for me, in those first few weeks, they taught me that relationships and connection and actually, do you know what? You need to find about, out about us, Mrs. Jackson, okay? Not, not about the music curriculum, but you actually need to find out about us. And that for me was the winning thing, all about values and what was very, very important to them, which then took me into a, a far deeper and more complex world with SEND and well-being and mental health. And I guess that's where I am now, really. I, you know... <laughs> I'm not scared anymore of helping people with some of the most complex things in education, with well-being and mental health. And as I said last night, you know, I could just about go on forever because I'm not short of a few words. So I am now going to pause and mute because otherwise... Just we... before you do, you mentioned the B word and I want to bring the B word up because I know every NQT is the same with the secondaries last night. That's It's, it's, it's a thing that at some point they're going to 
wish they had more strategies in terms of behavior. Uh, and especially uh, what I'm picking up is especially now where there's the, 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 the tension, the bubbles, the, the, the stress, the anxiety, the lack of movement. There's so many things that I think are contributing towards behavior being, being more of an issue. So I want to sort of touch on that to begin with, if that's okay, everybody, all the delegates. But just, you, you mentioned a piece of music. Just tell us the story because it, 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 it sh the story of where, that, where it started, because it shows that sometimes in our most extreme, what the hell am I going to do? Something comes to us that is just the right thing. Not always, but sometimes. So just tell us that. And then what I do, I want to go, I, I want to, go to, to Mark to talk a little bit about behaviour as well. But Nina, tell us where it started, that yeah, music. Absolutely. It was this, this class of unbelievable young people. Uh, and I felt threatened and I wasn't in control. I could not manage them. They were effing and blinding, tipping tables over, literally throwing chairs. And despite using all of the stuff out of Lee Cantor's assertive discipline book, because I'm well old, okay? Despite the fact I feel about 12. And I just thought to myself, this is it. This is it. I'm either gonna break down, start crying and walk out, and they're gonna laugh their heads off, or I need to take control. So I had this sort of little stage thing in my classroom and I just thought, it's gotta be a CD. I'm just gonna have to take a CD off the shelf. I had no idea which one I'd taken off the shelf, okay? Cause it, I was panicking. And I took the CD off and I put it in one of these sort of stackable stairs and I thought, I'll just go for number four, track four. So I put track four on and I stood there feet trying to glue myself to the stage and I don't know where it came from but I said right put your heads on the desk close your eyes we're going on a journey praying that track number four was not gonna be Mr Blobby anyway it turned out that it was the most amazing track of music that changed my life their lives and I think the light of so many. It was Gabriel Zorbo from the mission. And after about sort of 30 seconds, these kids, they, it, the room was silent. They had their eyes closed. They were almost sort of half sleeping on the desk. And this music, these sound waves that came from everywhere just hit them, hit them to the point where it completely changed the emotional makeup in that classroom. And at the end of it, I said, right, raise your heads, pull your chairs forward, let's have a little chat. And this is where it started for me. I really began to know young people from taking time to find out about them through that piece of music. Wow, it's really powerful. Um, anonymous attendee on the Q&A says, really interested in anything that will help with behaviour. So I think we've definitely started in the right place. Um, I was going to come to Mark. Jonathan, you're waving a pen. Is that because you want to say something or just because you're fending off no, the heron? I'm fiddling. I'm sorry, I'm fiddling. Okay. <laughs> That's okay. Mark, so I'll come to you next, Jonathan. Mark, in terms of, I mean, Nin just described her, the, the time where she thought she was going to jack it all in and something happened. Have you ever had a... I had a, okay, that's, I'm just, I just can't do this anymore. Well, and, and what did you do? Yeah, um, several times, um, including, you know, including, let's be honest, through the recent, you know, sort of months when you're sitting there thinking, how can I do this? Because, you know, to me, the big thing about teaching is all about that interaction and the relationships. Um, and I think, you know, sort of actually asking yourself those questions and, you know, you've heard it from um, Jonathan and Will earlier, you know, sort of actually, the people that do it you know sort of um, you know i'd like to think we all do it on a daily basis is the reality is actually it's not as easy and the part of the things is uh, i think it was george burns that said you know sort of sincerity is 90 percent of the battle and if you can fake that you've got it lit and i think that's part of it is actually you know you do need to put uh, actually that smile on i think meet the children at the door remember that they're going to come to the door with baggage but also don't diminish the own baggage that you, you're bringing to the door and i think it's really important because when you're looking at behavior days where i know that i get it wrong or where actually i'm forgetting myself um and you can invest lots and lots in the children but sometimes you've got to think about what's going on and if you don't acknowledge that then the day will go badly because you've got to think about what you do um and i think in terms of behavior 
uh, uh, you know, I'm, I'm lucky. I mean, you know, Jonathan and I are actually sort of like very similar habit, you know, being a ma- you know, being males within a, a um, within the primary. In actual fact, tonight's panel is very unrepresentative of primary, isn't it? But actually being the guy that you, you have sort of maybe have an, uh, um, an inherent advantage. But I think you look at what can you do. Getting to know the children is really important. And I fully be- believe in giving them a little bit of you to get uh, some of them back as well. So you've got to, you know, my children know that Elvis is my favourite um, singer. I mean, those of you that look on Twitter, you know, my handle is EP3577. The reason being it's Elvis Presley, the year he was born and the year he died. Um, but the children know that and I, I use music. I, you know, I would highly recommend Nina's book um, about music. But, you know, when you've got children turning around and saying to you, have we been good enough to be able to listen to Elvis? You sort of think you, you've done you, you've done something right because you play music in the classroom and you say, well, when you've been good, you'll get Elvis. And they think and it's there. It's there for them. Show them some of you. Show them your personality. Make sure that they see that passion, because I, I firmly believe if the children see that then actually they will join you they you know admit it's it's a scary thing for you and for them but in terms of the behavior don't think you're going to get it right every day and people will tell you this is what you do this is what works with my class but their class isn't your class and your class is going to be different today and we've all experienced the wet windy days and you know sort of before half term that will that will throw in a different context as well but you know perseverate and listen it goes back to what i said at the start and what will said as well you know get your role models talk to people because actually it becomes very easy and i would say especially at this time of being in your room and within your own bubble within a classroom and that's very dangerous especially when it comes to behavior talk to as many people as you can be prepared to take risks but if you get those relationships right fundamentally the children will be reward you richly Right, thank you. So the relationships is there and also this idea about bringing you, the human being, into the classroom as well. And sometimes there's this sense that we have to put on the mask, that we have to be somebody, we have to be a teacher and not ourselves. And yeah, there are, there are limits we don't stray over in terms of what we reveal of ourselves, but being, being ourselves, bringing yourself to the classroom, your authentic self to the classroom, I think is incredibly powerful. It makes it a little bit more scary, a little bit more vulnerable. But in my experience and also in all the conversations I've had with teachers around the world, that, that, it, that, that does seem to make the difference. It really does. Children see that you're not playing the game, that you are, that you are yourself. And they do seem to welcome that and rise to that. Once you make those, take time to build those relationships. I remember, the, I remember saying years ago, you know, the only thing I learned from my PGC was that teaching is about relationships. If you get those right, then, then it's fine. And, and if you get them right, children will leap through hoops of flame for you. And if you don't bother with them, it, you're leaping through their hoops of flame on an ongoing sort of basis. Talking of which, I do wonder what you threaten them with if they if, if you're good you can listen to Elvis if you're bad would you make them listen to some Elvis impersonator no two, two songs of Elvis <laughs> <laughs> yeah that would do it <laughs> can I just come in a little bit on that just to tie in with with the amazing discussions and things going on there and last night and this evening as well the, the word behavior um and Somebody was asking in the Q and A about you know anything to help with behaviour. So I'm going to ask you, um, what type of behaviour? Because there are so many differences of behaviours. There are those behaviours that are coded messages from some children to say, "My world is not okay, and you're the only one right now that can help me." Then there's that continuous, what I call sort of bubble popping. Um, behavior you know the, the 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 sort of the rumble stuff because once one starts somebody else is somebody else starts and it's it's not really behavior it's like a it's sort of like a you know i've got it so now you've got it and you're talking so i'll talk and what do you what do we really mean by behavior is it the behavior that we expect um are we role modeling what we want behavior to be like and I think we need to maybe also as practitioners to unravel what we mean by behavior. And is, is behavior bad behavior? It, it, that, that for me is a, is a question. I don't know what the rest of you think. And I hope that will help. Some Mark, other... you want to say something about before we go to Jonathan? Yeah, I think, I think that's really important what Nina said, because I think often when people talk about behavior, what they're really talking about is compliance. And I think actually in our classroom, I would certainly say what the, the behaviour I want is risk taking. I want children that are prepared to have a go. I want children to 
actually be prepared to put their hand up and go when they don't know the answer to be able to take me firing a question at them or, or having a question loaded ready knowing that they're going to come to it um, and I think that only comes if they feel safe in the classroom and they need to know that there's actually a safe space and that within that classroom that's what um, we need to role model that so that actually we are there and that they see us and when they come in we we actually ask them if we know that they're into something we ask them about it um you know you know what they're what they're into what their interests are if you know that especially at the moment if a family member's not well asking them talking to them about mums and dads and aunts and uncles and things and certainly i'm sure jonathan would find that at his school where he's probably got a whole network of families that he knows over that 20 years and i think that's really really important because if you want the behaviour, what I would call learning behaviour, not compliance, that's where the relationships um, comes in. I, I've, I've been in Jonathan's lessons and I've seen fantastic learning behaviour in terms of independent learners actively getting on with stuff, but not in a compliant way. So Jonathan, how, how, what's your secret? I don't know, it's 20 years in the making to, to sort of get to that point, but what's the secret to engagement without compliance? Uh, I think that um, to really echoes what lots of other people have said uh, initially in terms of just re investing in those relationships. Um, you said it, Ian, you know, the kids who will jump through fire um, if the relationship is right. Uh, and that was always something, it, was, it wasn't something I always did, to be honest. I did it, I started in year one, I did it in year one because you're dealing with five-year-olds and that's like the golden age of childhood. They're just, they're lovely at that age and they come into the classroom and you could be the worst teacher in the world and they're beaming at you it's just brilliant um but when i and I, like that was all perfect it's easy to invest in relationships when you've got kids in front of you like that but when i got moved to year six um i, I really really struggled and i struggled with behavior i struggled with i suppose I, I did that thing that will said at the start i i had this class and and they were miles away from the class that i really wanted do you know what I mean? I didn't, it was like, it wasn't what I'd envisaged year six being like. But my main problem on reflection, and it took me a while to come to this realisation, is that when I'd moved from year one to year six, I started to think that I had to be a year six teacher and that that was in some way different. Whereas what I'd done with the, with the five-year-olds is just teach a class of kids and deal with them as if they were children. With the year sixes, it was almost as if they were more grown up and therefore I had to be more grown up. And I forgot to do the investment stuff. I forgot the, the impact of stickers on kids and the fact that even the most streetwise year six kids will do anything for a sticker um, because it comes from you. And because if you invest in relationships, they care about you and they're bothered. And so all of that stuff, like I said, that's the stuff that feeds into children who will do incredible things, uh, who, will, uh, who will work independently um because demonstrated that belief in them so there's that kind of reciprocal relationship whereby do you know what i trust you you're a phenomenal group of young people i trust you um and so i'm going to give the responsibility for this learning to you in the full knowledge that you're going to do a great job with it um so there's some of that kind of um i suppose some of it links into some actual practical strategies that you use don't you to create that air of expectation in a sense so all that, that Bill Rogers, um, he's great behaviour um, kind of uh, person and what have you, written some great books. Um, but the idea of, of using a, a thank you at the end of your sentence instead of a please um, is just, it leaves the children with that air of expectation. I don't need to hover over you. I just, I want you to get on with your work, thank you. And I'm going to move on instantly because I just, I trust you to do it. And with enough of that kind of atmosphere building, that trust becomes incredibly strong. And those children will then just, thrive they'll just rise to meet every kind of challenge you give them um but like i say it's uh, in order to get there you, we work hard at it and, and like i say there's loads of practical things you can do for me one of the best things i ever did in year six was show and tell which i'd always done without thinking in year one uh, for anyone out there who's never done show and tell it's basically the kids bring in crap from home and speak about it on the carpet um and it but it's it's phenomenal because you get to know about those children uh, it's a really brilliant way into it, just giving them time. And at the moment, there's a risk that stuff like that gets dismissed. Um, you, again, because of, uh, I don't know whether, I, I, I hope I've not frozen. Uh, some can people hear, we can still hear you, you're frozen. Still still hear you. I just think that some of that stuff can, can, like I say, can get dismissed because it's, um, you know, you might not have, I'm not aware of any great amount of research and um, 
you know, standardized controlled trials about show and tell. Um, but just because it's not measurable doesn't mean it's not valuable. Uh, and there was that great quote I think, from uh, Dorothy Hethcott, um, phenomenal educator, the idea that, um, you know, teaching is a craft that in some people works like an art. And all of that cognitive science stuff, it can tell us an awful lot about the craft of teaching, but nothing about the art of it. Um, and a large part of that art sits within relationships and how we build them. And like I say, getting to know those children. And, and for me, that's something as simple as doing show and tell with year sixes made an enormous difference with a very, very challenging set of kids. All of a sudden we sat there together as a little community within our own classroom and we just talked to each other. Uh, and I told them stories about me, as, as Mark alluded to, you know, you give something of yourself uh, and they told me stories that they had and they brought things from home and they shared things. And they were the kind of things that would be inconsequential to anybody else, you know, but to those kids, there were things that mattered. Um, and, and, and from that point, I suppose, we got to know each other, we trusted each other. And then, then you get to the point where, like I say, those incredible things can happen. Look, you mentioned the cognitive science. One of our associates, Dr. Andrew Curran, is a paediatric neurologist, and I was speaking to him a couple of weeks ago, and he's doing some of the research about going back to the source research about the brain, about the learning, about the neuroscience of learning. And he's saying what's interesting is that the, the cognitive scientists, even though they might not be aware of it, when you look at actually their work and where it comes from and the, and the neurobiology, it's all about relationships. They might not, they're, they're not putting that up as that's what that's the key but actually under underpinning it all it is this idea and that's what joins the traditionalists and the and the and the and the, the those looking for something a little bit more avant-garde the, those who see it as a craft those who see it as art you get the relationships right and everything else sort of comes from that so that that's going to be the light motive really from from today one of the in terms of little techniques i remember um a teacher years ago was asking me what she's got you know her it was a secondary teacher her least favorite group what could she could she do i said well just pretend they're your favorite group and she went, eh, okay. And she said within four weeks, she had turned that group around. And I said, what did you do? She said, well, I smiled when they walked through the door. And I said, I'm pleased to see you. And I said, thank you for coming. I enjoyed teaching you. And it's um, this idea, uh, Jackie Beer, another associate brought it up yesterday, who's worked across the spectrum of, of schools, including primary. And she talked about fake it till you make it, uh, which sort of resonates with the George Bernard Shaw quote from earlier. This just, just look like you want to see them. And that's half the, half the battle won. Um, Will, thank you for telling yes. us about your yes. view of relationships and, and, and community and how knowing the children. Um, yes, uh, I, there's, there's loads of things I'd, li I'd like to comment on. Uh, first, just a general thing about behavior, if I can just say this. I think in primary schools, the raw material is actually very, very good. Because whilst the NQTs are at home, uh, sleeping better, I hope, at the moment and things like that, the children in their classes will be heading towards Clinton cards this week, ready to buy gifts to the best teacher in the world. Now, that's quite a, th a rapid growth from September to Christmas to be the best teacher in the, in the world. And there's, there's two reasons why teachers get that gift to the best teacher in the world. Uh, first of all, they could be the best teacher in the world, which is right and fitting but primary kids actually want you to be the best teacher in, in the world. Uh, they put you on a pedestal. They go home and talk about you. Uh, they sit the teddy bears on the floor and they play at being you and they talk to the teddy bears like, like you talk to them. Uh, if I could give a general tip on charisma, uh, David Hodgson wrote a brilliant book uh, a, a few years ago, uh, The Little Book of Charisma. Uh, and there's some brilliant ideas in there about charismatic teaching. And I think that's a great help in establishing relationships. Uh, I, I think a lot of NQ, I've, I've been uh, in, in many NQTs classrooms over the years, and I think a lot of them get um, uh, stressed by the low level stuff. And I can talk a little bit about that in the moment, but you talked about community. Uh, so there I was with these uh, 25 odd kids, odd being the, 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 the key words, uh, as an NQT, probationary teacher in Greensborough in, in South Yorkshire. 80% of the class uh, were boys, uh, so that was somewhat disproportionate. Nina used a phrase earlier on, she said, uh, Miss, you need to find out about us. Uh, and that's true that you have to find out what makes this group of children tick, both individually and collectively. Now, I have to admit, this was a slightly different era, 1974. But one of the things I quickly discovered, actually, was these were outdoor kids. 
they preferred being outdoors to indoors. The classroom in many ways was a little bit alien. These were kids who, who fished in the local canal. They rode the bike around Greensborough Dam. They built dens on the estate of Earl Fitzwilliam, who, who has the largest house frontage in the United Kingdom. They love cricket, they love football, and they supported Rotherham United. In many ways, Greensborough and Rotherham was their world. So I, I, and this is where the miners lump comes in, in many ways. There you go, Jonathan, show and tell. Uh, this was their world. So, and this was before national curriculum. So I made their world the focus of what we did. We, we went outdoors. We did bird watching on Greensboro Dam. We, we, we went and drew sketches of new stubbing colliery. Uh, and then I, I provided the geography and the history and the science and the writing opportunities and the poetry to, to, to go with it. Uh, and I don't know why I really got the miners lamb, but I think really somebody was saying, welcome to Greensboro, lad. Uh, this is our heritage. And I think children sometimes are growing up today without their heritage being celebrated. And I still argue that the square mile around a school is the greatest learning resource it has. Yes, we do have a national curriculum now, but one of my tips is always start local because it's a way of making the children and that community feel valued. Um, yeah, all that stuff. Yeah, do smile. Make sh a general tip. Whenever the children are in transition around the school, whether it's going to playtime, coming from assembly, make sure systems are in place for that to be orderly. Make sure that the resources are always on a desk a bit before the children come in that they're going to need. Don't start off with go to your drawers and fetch. Make sure everything's there before they go out and, and it's there when they come back so the lesson gets off uh, to, to, to a, a great start. Make sure your learning environment is positive. Don't let it suffer from piles. Piles are this and piles are that. Keep it tidy, keep it smart. Learn how to develop a wicked glower when you're unhappy with somebody rather than un uh, feeling the need to ad address the whole class. Uh, go for the eye contact. Uh, do smile at them uh, and always look for the positives. You know, it's silly stuff like this table sitting nicely. Show me that you're ready. I've finished now here. <laughs> you, you mentioned, thank you. You may, I'll come to you next, David. And I want to talk about sort of naughty personalities or good personalities or those sort of things, whether you've got an angle there. But um, Jessica, uh, um, uh, oh no, it's uh, Nadja, how do you cope with low level disruption? I find that the most irritating and infuriating behavior issue. Is, it, is there anything you want to add? Because you mentioned it, Will, on um, uh, low level disruption, as it's called. Um, yeah, it, 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 it is, first of all, it's about accentuating the positive. Uh, try to, when I went into my second headship, um, it was uh, in a school that was literally down on its knees for a whole variety of reasons. It felt like behaviour was one of the significant challenges. And I, I got talking to an educational psychologist and, and sometimes teachers are not good enough at talking to the other people who are there to support schools. Uh, and it, I said to her, it feels like every child is misbehaving. And she said, you're wrong analyze it closely and, and it's, it'll be no more than 5% in, in any class. Um, and it is largely for me about routines. Some of that I, I, I've touched upon. I can still see experienced teachers start a lesson before everybody is listening. Uh, make sure everybody's listening. Use your eyes. Your eyes are one of the most powerful tools you have got in your armory. Your eyes can smile, your eyes can show discontent, and they can show that without needing to pause a lesson. Uh, make sure you get the right eye contact. Uh, and sometimes it's about planning the kind of responses you want to get from the children as well. You know, in, in your lesson, it, it ties in with the charisma stuff. Can you almost plan for the children to suddenly drop their jaw open or, or, or gasp with excitement? Plan for, for that kind of thing. Transition is uh, around a building is significant. If the children aren't arriving in that room ready to listen and, and start work, that is often where it, it, it unfolds badly. And certainly when, I, and that can be a whole school thing, that's not, sometimes the NQT is at the sharp end of failures elsewhere within the school. 
certainly in the second headship, we, we, we looked at how children were coming in off the playground and we made sure that there were adults in every place where there could be a potential disruption or, or poor behaviour, including the boys' toilets. Uh, boys' toilets can be a significant uh, problem. Uh, always look to promote the positives. Um, yeah. you know, let positive exchanges in your classroom exchange the negative ones by at, le at least three to one and preferably five to one. Tell the children when they're doing well. I, I'm, I'm not good at multitasking, uh, but, but um, somebody put something about values education up higher up, uh, higher up as well. Have a code of conduct within your classroom. When my children went to secondary school. Their first piece of homework was writing the rules of the department in the back of their exercise book. And every department had a different set of rules. And they were always full of don't do this, don't do that. Uh, go for the positives. Uh, I have a code of conduct. Uh, when I'm working with children, sometimes I, I, I have this kind of code about developing the craftsmanship of being a, a scholar, which is on every table. And we give feedback against that. We have, uh, I try to pr promote uh, a, a, a kind of model uh, for self-evaluating high quality work. Don't hand your work in to me unless you can demonstrate pride and perseverance. Unless it's original, it's unique, unless you're built on prior learning and move towards a target. They're, they're all important messages. Okay. Uh, and I'll just say dinner times can be a nightmare as well. Or if you're in the South of England, lunch times. <laughs> Loads of wisdom there, loads of ideas there. Um, thank you for that. Well, um, David, so you've been sitting there very patiently. Yeah, what, very are good. Are we, are we got are some kids just not, are they naughty kids and good kids? Is that yeah. what it boils down to? Well, I think before that, the um, the quote, children don't care how much you know until you they know how much you care. That's often mentioned around ITL circles. And I think that is uh, summarizes what we've been talking about. And so that's at the heart of everything that's got to be there. Um, when I've observed teachers to look at what are the best teachers do and what is it that's happening in classrooms, then sometimes personality is important. So you'll have some children that are naturally more um, talkative, naturally more fidgety. And I know there's a doctor in uh, David Casey in America. He um, started to look at personalities as a way to address behavior because he noticed that so many children were being um, diagnosed as having ADHD and then prescribed Ritalin. And this is 25 years ago when they didn't know what the long-term impact was. They didn't, and up to 20% of boys particularly were being given a drug that didn't know what was going to, the, the impact would be. Um, so he started to look at personality difference and his work links into some of the, if, if anyone's had a go at the personality quiz, um, when I've been into schools and, and looked at the personality of kids, so I've sometimes been asked to go in it and said, can you work with the naughty? It's basically the naughty group. It's the group of kids. It's, they usually call it the nurture group, but it's the group of kids that they just, they put them in a porter cabin half a mile away from the main school building, uh, which is probably the worst thing you could do with the, the, na the naughty kids. Um, and when we look at their personality, when I explain the model to them, there is a predominance of two particular types of, of young people. And it's not surprising which ones they are. They turn out in the personalities, panthers and falcons. And they're the kids that, uh, when I went into Jonathan's school a few years back, the kid that greeted me at the as I went in and chatted to me, told me, asked me what I was doing there, who I was gonna be working with, told me his life story, I, I he was in the class that I was with for the day and at the end of the day I said to J Jonathan said were there any children you particularly remember and I said oh that lad such and such was particularly great and uh, Jonathan said well he's the only one we've had to exclude um, even though we don't have a we have a no exclusion policy because his behavior is just very difficult to cope with and um, so some children are naturally like that so I think the way to cope with their behaviour um, is to uh, allow them as much slack as possible, give them activities that mean they can shine, they can 
work in groups and then perform something to the whole class. And when, when they're given that opportunity, it's amazing how different uh, the whole atmosphere is in the class. And then there are other children, I think, who are often neglected. We often focus on those children, quite rightly, they need attention, but the children who are the opposite of those, so there's about 30% of, of children that are the ones that are the invisible children that go right the way through school, often without being noticed or acknowledged, that the ones that, um, and it, you know, as a parent, I had one of each. I had one child who was the one that the teachers, if I went to a parent's evening, the teachers would be talk about my son without looking at any of their notes because they knew exactly who he was and what he'd been up to. Uh, and they'd always say at the end of the, the chat, your son needs to learn to calm down a bit just to give other children a chance to contribute. And then with my daughter, she's in the other camp, the opposite. The teacher could not talk about my daughter without looking at their notes because they didn't know who she was because she was so quiet. Um, and, and often quietness is, is taken as a sign that, that you know everything's fine. And actually it can be worse. So that kind of behavior is is a teacher needs to be really aware of that as well. And they, at the end of the chat with that teacher, they'd always say, your daughter needs to learn to speak up more and contribute more in class. And I think what we need to do as teachers is to give them a how to. It's not just what do you need to do, they need a how to. And that's the, the basis of that is all the relationship building that everyone's talked about. When the relationships are strong, everything's strong. And there was one thing that came to mind when you were talking about Andrew Curran, Ian, and his research. And I've been looking into some of the research and it just shows how important relationships are. We are creature, animals that need to have strong relationships. And there was a bit of research where they got people to look at the foot of a hill and individuals that were asked to estimate, they were told they were gonna to have to climb the hill and they were asked to estimate the angle of the hill. And then they got, compared that with when they asked two people standing together who were, were going to be asked to climb the hill together to estimate the angle of the hill and when and the, the answers was, were consistent that the people that were together thought the angle recorded the angle as lower um, than the one that was going to have to climb it on their own and so this this idea that we're we're creatures where we we have to form bonds and relationships with other human beings is so essential to what we are as a human. And we're just starting to see how deep that, that goes. Right. It's always fascinating hearing your, your insights, Debbie, because you come at it from a sort of a, a slightly different angle from the, the pure teacher, but it's so useful in terms of understanding how human beings operate and react and interact. Inter, interact. So it was useful, thank you for that. Um, I want to come to Jonathan based, I'm, a, I'm aware by the way in the Q&A, uh, Mark and Jonathan are just doing their own thing in there. So every time I see a question, so they'll be typing in an answer to it. So um, if any of you uh, uh, delegates uh, uh, want to know some of the questions that have been answered, if you go to the Q&A, the middle box there, it says answer. There's nine that have been answered, but Mark and Jonathan just sort of tapping away there. Things around EAL. I was going to bounce that to Nina, but that, that's fine. There's an answer there. But there are some really good comments and really good stuff in there, so don't miss that. Um, I just want to bounce from Will yes. to Jonathan. Right by way of a banana, because it's something that Will said about make sure all your stuff is out and everything's ready and don't have piles of stuff everywhere and get it all ready. But then also it resonates with something that I've heard Jonathan talk about, about the banana, which I'll come to. Um, but the, the, the overall topic I want you to think about really is to what extent, I, I know that all of you are very, inno very innovative when it comes to pedagogy and also when it comes to curriculum, you, you, you work within the parameters of what you have to deliver, but there is a creativity in the way that you do it, both in terms of your teaching, but also in the nature of the curriculum. So I'm just wondering to what extent the NQTs feel that they have some sense of autonomy over how they deliver what they deliver and the things that they deliver. And if you can sort of build your banana story into that, Jonathan, then I'll owe you a pint. Uh, <laughs> um, I think that, uh, that's, it's a really interesting one, the idea of that kind of autonomy and um, because as a, as a young teacher I felt that I had virtually none. It was 
I was in my classroom, I had to get on with the things that I was told to do. Um, again, on reflection years later, I realized that wasn't and had never been the case. Actually, within my own classroom, I had quite a lot of kind of power, if you like, or the ability to, to, to do things, but like you said, within the framework of the school's curriculum. Um, and it, it hadn't really dawned on me. I wish it had dawned on me sooner. Um, uh, in terms of the, the, the shift I made from year one to year six, um, again, I was kind of, um, it was it, it really it it shocked me in a way the the way in which the children kind of responded because I was early years trained in university and like I said I got my first job in year one and I was very used to being in among in amongst young children of that age and and being used to how they responded and in year one uh, and in foundation stage um kind of used to really high levels of, of independence in a sense you know you, you think quite often with young children that they are very very dependent on the teachers and um, but you only have to spend 10 minutes in a foundation stage or early years to see that the adults are almost an irrelevance um you know they, they're not but those children are uh, highly independent in terms of the way they access resources uh you know if they need something to write with they'll go and find something and they don't care what it is they're not bothered it can be a felt tip crayon stick stone blood makes no difference if they want to make a mark they will make a mark and when they've done it frequently due to really high quality training from early years practitioners they go and put that thing back and what really struck me about the year sixes is that there was no doubt that they had developed they had made progress uh, you know they knew more stuff they could do more stuff in maths they could write more sophisticated sentences um, but in terms of independence that it, that was really staggering and I found kind of lessons that kind of ground to a halt at points over a, a broken pencil you know a year six child who would be utterly stumped and would put their hand up and call me over to solve that particular issue for them. Um, and the, the, the fact that these year sixes are just, by that point, become so accustomed to just leaning into the middle of their table to get what they needed, uh, to get on with their work, and, and the fact that it was, it's, if it wasn't there. Um, and it just struck me that when we talk about children making progress, you know, we, we shouldn't just be talking about that academic progress, the fact that they can do more complicated calculations or whatever else. Mm -hmm. It's got to be in the broadest possible sense. You know, surely if kids are, are, are pretty independent aged four, they should be significantly more independent when they're aged 11. Um, and I know from talking to secondary colleagues, you know, those kind of horror stories from year seven teachers, um, with the child in their classroom who gets to the... Um, it just that's it. Um, but it, it, it to be there. Uh, and so actually one of the with did you lose me then a minute but yeah you're coming you're going in and out a little bit can you do you want to um just sorry. switch off and come back in again jonathan that might that might help do that right i'm leaving okay because we still haven't heard the banana bit so uh, everybody's on tender hooks now we can't leave us without your banana story <laughs> um mark sort of linking to that really and, and we did a brilliant um what now we conversation you and jonathan talking about curriculum and resilience and uh, um, problem solving everything just what in it what is it in the way that you work that means that your children actually did okay during lockdown and, and have done okay since certainly the class you had when I did some funk sessions with you over lockdown that, that particular class and maybe if you can mention your uh, the unhomework work as well because I want to go from this into workloads I think and then we can move from that into um, uh, well-being I think and bring Nina in so your curriculum, and we'll come back to you, Jonathan, if you're, if you're stable later. Um, yeah, no, I mean, I, I think one of the big things is, you know, make the children responsible and give them real responsibility. I mean, I've talked before, I mean, Jonathan talks about the children, but, you know, I, I would suggest, you know, as you move children around the club, around the school, you know, who do you have at the front of the line? Um, who, who do you have at the back of the line? Who's in the middle? You know, the front of the line, you know, that, that's going to be your stereotypical naughty children. Um, you know, and why have you got them at the front of the line? Um, it's because you want to keep an eye on them. Who have you got at the back of the line? Well, they're you good, they're you good kids that are basically your grasses and they'll tell you what's going on. Um, you know, the ones in the middle are the ones that you forget. And I think actually, if we, that, that's the sort of responsibility children get. You know, it's like, oh, well, you're the line leader and you're the line ender. And you think, no, give them real responsibility, make it, it important. And one of the things that I think is fundamental in uh, the children's learning is that they have that responsibility. If they're going to do a piece of partner work or group work there's a real um responsibility for them in what they're doing it goes back to 
um, what Will said, that they create their own set of rules for the class. And in primary, you know, that, that's what they do, that they're non-negotiables. In some of the comments earlier, people were saying, oh, we've got children talking over each other. Well, if they've had it imposed upon them, actually, but when then that's possibly what they do. But if they have it that they've created it, then they, they know what the rules are. They're not silly. They, they, they know the rules for learning. They could create it. And if you have that ethos that the children are responsible, it makes it an awful lot more um, enjoyable for you. And it takes a lot of the pressure off. Um, one of the things that sort of that came about for me was from the book, and Nina's put it on the stream earlier, on homework. And the subheading is, you know, um, how to get the most out of homework without really setting it. And the idea is, is that children take that responsibility. The best home learning I've had, despite us um, having some and making some suggestions, were the children that went away and did things that we hadn't set. So one of the children went away. Um, she's one of my pretty weak um, children on in terms of her uh, literacy, but she went away and decided to write an acrostic about the Tudors. That wasn't even something we'd suggested. Somebody else went away and I'd happened to get the hook into the children, showing them a clip um, for the Tudors, showing them a clip from the musical Six. And she went away and found the song that I had done and recreated the lyrics, rewrote them, did them color coding based on the different um, what Wives of Henry VIII singing. And then she actually could tell me the facts about them because she then went away and used that as a stimulus um, for the research. But far too often we don't empower the children. It's almost like, right, this is the box and this is what I've got to, to do. I mean, we touched on SATs earlier, we may well come back to it, but I think sometimes we get too afraid of that. And certainly with year six, you know, we think, oh, well, we've got to do that because they're going to get ready for secondary school. And in year five, or oh, we better do this because next year they're year six and then they're going to be doing their sats and then they're off to secondary school. And before too long, we'll be down um, sort of in nursery preparing them because we better do this because it won't be too long before they're in year six and they're off in secondary school. And if we actually empower the children to make the mistakes, give them the space to make mistakes, but let them direct some of the things that they actually do will make a huge difference. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I'll, I'll, this idea about you get control by giving control. That's something I remember from my, when I was teaching and what I've shared with teachers since that we sometimes think we have to take it all like that. And sometimes that's the worst thing we can do in order to, to have better control over a particular class. You get it by, by, by giving it. Jonathan, are you, are you feeling stable? I think so. That <laughs> seems to keep going. I think it's all right. Um, quick. Yes, <laughs> I think it's, um, yeah, that kind of idea of uh, it's become quite common, I think. Certainly the, the way I was trained as a teacher, that path of least resistance model, um, you know, we need to get from A to B as quickly as possible. And that, that makes you behave in a certain way as a teacher. You know, you do kind of take things out of the way which might get in the way of the pace of your lesson. Um, and that, that means that as kids go up through school, they become more and more static. Um, we provide more and more for them because we've been told that in this lesson in order to be outstanding we've got to show rapid and sustained progress or some other nonsense um, and lots of that's come from Ofsted and the, the kind of language they've used um, and they have changed the tune now um, but it had an impact on us as teachers and like I say it, it made us kind of obsess over pace getting through stuff having everything kind of ready um, and, and like I said I suppose that transition to year six for me made me question some of that in a sense seeing the output of that the outcome of that and the contrast with those young learners um, and, and really the, the I suppose that the point at which I, I just stopped and decided to do something about it was the the the, the banana incident um, which was around snack time because we had snack in year six like we'd had snack in year one but in year six, it was highly regimented because uh, I, I didn't want to waste any time because I had a lot of stuff to do, a lot of stuff to teach. I had to get through it all. So highly regimented. I brought the kids in. I, I lined them up at the playtime. I reminded them about getting the fruit from their bags, bringing it into the classroom. Um, I was stood at the front of the classroom, directing them in from the door, big smile on my face, dead positive, reminding them not to forget the fruit to collect. Oh, 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 oh. <laughs> <laughs> Almost got to the banana. <laughs> <laughs> we'll we'll have to come back to Jonathan. There's a question. Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, we'll I don't think we'll ever get there, Jonathan. Let me just go to Mark. What have we got? We've got 20 minutes to go. Um, there's a question coming from Anonymous about um, back to behaviour, but in terms of children's friendships and relationships, the sitting in rows is really difficult. Many don't like their partner, and all they do is constantly complain during lessons. I've moved a few, but don't want to set, set, see that as a precedent. 
if if you can just give us your view on that from the front line, Mark. But then also, I think Will may have a view on children from different who might not necessarily like each other, but being in the same classroom and how that how that works from your experience in Rotherham, Will maybe. But Mark, what what would be your sort of quick tip for that thing? And, and we'll see if Jonathan can come back with his banana. Uh, <laughs> um, a, a couple of things. I suppose it depends on what you want to do in your class. So obviously the draconian ways I'm going to decide and that's what you do. Um, the more liberal and free ranging is that you turn around and let the children choose their partners. If you've got that contract and that agreement that we talked about earlier, that actually they know that it's all about learning and now they're choosing their partners just to sit and chat with. Um, do you offer them, uh, you know, you can have a mix of the two. Um, I would allow the children to move. My children in my class, I've maintained it that we, for the first half term, they had a learning partner for a week um, and they've worked through and it, you know, and actually talk to them when it has, has broken down. Because also I think it's important, going back to what I said earlier about giving a little bit of yourself, make them realise that actually, yes, relationships are difficult, but relationships are difficult and they need to um, work on them. And actually, this is why I've put you together. You know, talk about the skills, do that positive that... Um, Will talked about earlier, look, you've got this and you've got this and together, this is what you you can produce and be prepared to have that. But also don't neglect where, they, where the children are at the moment. Some of the children have been used to having no interaction with each other and actually possibly getting their own way all the time. So I think it comes down to what you want as a teacher, but I do think there is a lot of store in explaining and making sure the children have that understanding. It's about a learning partner and actually they've got those relationships, but provide opportunities where they are swapping and moving around as much as you feel comfortable and, you know, including wiping desks down, etc. Yeah. Will, so Nina, do you want to add anything on that? I'm aware, Jonathan, I'm, I'm, I'm wary of coming to you. You might have to type your answer about the banana and just so we can, we can get a gestalt on that before we finish. Um, and Nina, is there anything you want to add in terms of the sort of the relationships and the low level behaviour and everything from your experience? And I know you've also got a you've got an EAL. There was an EAL question. You've got an EAL angle, and you've got a send angle as well. Whether there's anything there before we come to Will uh, on the, the thing about bringing people together who might not want to be together. Sound, sound, Nina. Oh, I'm so on the tech. Normally, I can't believe it. Um, on, on the low level disruption and things like that, I, I just want to just reiterate the fact that. The, the children sometimes will 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 need and want to have that low level disruption chit chat um, communication, and it's not necessarily to do with you or the topic or the fact that it's not interesting. So I would suggest that what you actually do occasionally is say, right, this is me time, you time, our time, which is actually in the uh, shameless plug of teaching, learning and sherbet lemons, okay, a compendium of careful advice for teachers. And on one of the chapters is they will ignore you until they want you. But the, th the whole idea is, is that if you allow them to have what I call chit chat time, interaction time, share time, and even though they're in their desks and things right now due to the bubble, have any of you actually tried that what I call them um like a i've lost my train of thought like a clothesline where everybody puts a little note for somebody else and actually travels around the room it doesn't it, it doesn't matter because what you end up having is you end up having this low level but almost really excited discussion about learning or or whatever the topic will be but you get it to travel around the room and you can change pegs and you can change ideas it's about being creative of how to involve them in in the whole idea of now is pause time, now is mute time. I mean, it's brilliant, actually, even if you have a remote control in your classroom and you go, I'm going to zap you, I'm going to zap you. And for the rest of you, you're all going to get those secret tokens. There's nothing like having a pocket full. And ladies, we do like to have pockets in our dresses or trousers. But you have what I call secret thank you tokens. OK, and I used to like slide them to people very quietly. And at the end, people would go, I got 31 thank you tokens. And the ones who'd been sort of quietly doing this in the back. What, what do you mean? What do you mean? What's those thank you tokens? Oh, right. OK, listen up, listen up, listen up. There's lots of tips and tricks. Yeah. And we're quarter past eight. 
Okay. I will right now mute myself so we can go banana. <laughs> I've given up with the banana now. I don't want to know. I don't want to no, see a banana not. ever again. <laughs> I'm going to go to Will. We'll see whether we can get Jonathan. Okay. Um, can I just say a couple of things uh, about uh, the, the desks uh, in, in rows? And I also noticed there's a question from another anonymous uh, attendee about children only working in, in ability levels. Uh, I, now, the people out there will know probably more about pandemic regulations than what I do. Uh, but one of the things I would say generally in normal times, uh, desks aren't, uh, we're not flexible enough with our classrooms. And sometimes you want the desks in this kind of a formation. Sometimes you want it in a horseshoe formation. Sometimes you do want them in groups. Sometimes you want the children to work with the children who are diagonally opposite them rather than the, sitting at, at the side of them. And I don't know, I, I understand the bit about the rows at the moment, and I don't know whether this is feasible or not, but do you always have to have the same two children sat by each other? Or, or could the, the, the pairings alter uh, according to, to, to uh, the, 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 the kind of material being studied or whatever? Uh, should children only work in, with ability groups? Uh, absolutely not in my view. Uh, I think um, there's a, a, I'm a great fan of mixed ability teaching anyway. Um, and sometimes we have overcomplicated teaching as well. Uh, but sometimes I think children learn as much from each other as they do from a teacher. And, and, and certain children have got the, the power to pull other children all, along uh, and lead in different ways in different subjects uh, along the way. Uh, another thing perhaps that ties in uh, with the uh, pandemic bit at, at this particular moment in time is teach the children outdoors. I do as much as, you know, it's, it's a great time to be outdoors. And autumn is a great time to be outdoors. And many schools have invested a huge amount of money in, in kind of nature areas, forest schools initiatives, allotments or whatever it is. Uh, you know, I, I, in here there are 33 uh, uh, things that teachers should routinely be doing outdoors, which are really good primary teaching strategies. Uh, I don't think, for example, great writers start behind a desk. I think great writers start in an environment. And there's something, there's ideas in there about how children can start to drink an environment in through the senses and then start to share words and phrases with each other because, let's face it, everybody up here in, in this group has written stuff, but that stuff gets written and uh, uh, read by other people who, who offer their contributions. Teach the children outdoors at this moment in time is a brilliant thing. Uh, children who don't like sitting near, uh, uh, near each other. Um, after the EU referendum in 2016 uh, in, in Rotherham, because I spent all my 47, oh, 47 years, basically, well, 38 years working in Rotherham, and, and I started as a probationary teacher, ended up as being responsible for all the primary schools with, within the borough. But after the 2016 referendum, we've got a number of EU communities uh, with, within the neighbourhood. and. Uh, the children from uh, Polish, Hungarian, Romanian backgrounds uh, in some schools were greeted with a new lot are on your way back home now. This is our country, sling your hook. Uh, the tensions were quite intense. Uh, in 2000 and uh, around 2011, uh, Rotherham was dragged, dragged through the mire on child sexual exploitation scandals. Uh, and yes, all the television cameras came with their satellite crews and George Alagaya was there and everybody liked that. Uh, and then eventually they moved away and you're left with a group of town centre schools where you have got children who are in the families who have been victims of child sexual exploitation sitting side by side with the families who have been perpetrators of child sexual exploitation. Now you can imagine, and coupled with that, Britain first uh, were, were marching through the streets of Rotherham on a regular basis. 14 times they marched through the streets of Rotherham, bringing a, a kind of brand of hatred with them as well. Tensions were quite intense. The best schools use the children as a learning resource as well. Uh, and they looked at the journeys of some of the families to Rotherham. Why do so many people come from this small community in Pakistan to set up home in Rotham? 
what brings them here what are they leaving behind what are they bringing why is ramadan important to them but equally what about the the white families who've been here forever you, you know what what's their story uh, and if it's about the eu migrant families why have you come from poland to the united kingdom uh what brought you here and what's it like in poland uh, and, it, and it's about using the children as a, a resource to understand each other um, and the more we can help and, and I, I think there's a lot of stuff politically going on at the moment uh, which is is not helping uh, racial attitudes I am glad that Black History Month uh, is being used much more significantly at present than perhaps it has been has been has done in the, in the past but the more we can help children to live harmoniously in rapidly changing communities the better life will be uh, and i've perhaps picked some real extreme examples of children not being able to get on with each other but use the children as a resource but it shows in those extremes it can be done um, we wrote a collaborative book which i think everybody here contributed just about uh, called the working class which isn't on the nqt list it's a, it's in a different but it's it's published by independent thinking press um and one of the things it argues for is that whatever your background whatever your culture whether it's one whether it's a working class culture whether it's a culture from somewhere else in the world if you value that that's so significant in the classroom this idea about let's be colorblind let's pretend we're all the same it's the worst possible thing that you can do. And Will wrote, it was quite a long piece, but I wanted it all in about going round to a number of schools in Rotherham and just exploring, just, just being there and finding out what they did given those extremes uh, to, in order to, to, to create, even though the community might have, said, there might have been a sense of splintering within the community, that in the primary schools, that was where the community was healing and it was sort of growing out from there. It's incredibly, it's incredibly powerful. So thank you for that, Will. Well, so Go on. I was going to say that one of the best moments in, in that piece of research, uh, you know, there, there was always this theory, ah, but that, that, that lot have come from uh, Hungary, Poland, Pakistan, or wherever, they, they don't integrate with us. And one of the best bits was watching, uh, watching uh, a school brass band full of Asian pupils, uh, you know, banging away, playing uh, on Ultimo Barta, uh, and they say, and they say they don't integrate. Uh, thank you, Ian. Yeah, no, that's okay. So thank you for that. Uh, with regard to the outdoors education, you were waving oh, a book. Juliet yes. stuff. Yes. Yeah. Well, show us your book because somebody was asking about that. But what we've also got, so show us that one because I don't think that's right, it's called. It, it's a leadership book in many ways, and it's a story. Uh, but it, it's um, once upon a time we had a Secretary of State called Michael Gove. You might have heard of him, uh, and he said, uh, "As a teacher, I'm a traditionalist. I believe children learn best sat in rows, reciting poetry, knowing the kings and queens of England." And the head teacher in this particular book says, well, if he says that, we'll teach the children outdoors. Not all the time, because that'd be a little bit silly. Uh, but it, it comes up with 33 things which children could and, and should do routinely outdoors. And some of them are absolutely dead simple. Yeah. Uh, yeah, but it, it, I, but what's, the what's the title of that, Will? Oh, dear. Right. I wanted it called The Strife of Brian, but it's called Dare to be Drift Different, a leadership fable about transformational change in schools. There's some ideas in this particular book as, as well about creating a sense of awe, wisdom and spirituality outdoors. Inspirational teachers, inspirational learners. Thank All you. important. Yeah. Putting that in. With regard to uh, outdoor learning, one of our associates who couldn't make it today because she's so busy, Juliet Robertson, she's written two brilliant award winning books about teaching outdoors, especially EYFS. The most recent one is called Messy Maths. Uh, the very first one that she wrote for Independent Thinking Press has got my favourite title that we've ever done, which is called Dirty Teaching, and which is all about taking kids outside of them. And she's one of the world's leading experts on outdoor learning. So, um, uh, and, and uh, Dirty Teaching, one of them is in the, the NQT theory. I can't remember if it's Messy Maths or Dirty Teaching, but also she does a blog, um, Creative Star, I think she is, Nina might find her, uh, and there's all sorts of ideas there. So in this COVID world, being outside, we know, is so, the more outside we can be, the, the better. Remember, there's no such thing as bad weather, just bad clothing, so it can be done. Um, uh, but also in terms of the engagement that Will was alluding to earlier, the, the young people who perhaps aren't doing what we want them to behind the behind the desks, but outside, just, it just transforms the way that they work. Um, David, I'll come to you, and then well, we've got five minutes, and, and I'm, I'm still, fingers crossed for Jonathan's banana, but David, anything you want to add with regard to taking control or yeah. community or, or, or people collaborating when they perhaps don't think they want to? 
Yeah, I think that if we look at the difference between using cooperation and competition, some ch ch children need to learn how to do both well, but some may have a preference for one or the other. One of the best things I saw in a classroom was a teacher that got a group of children of different abilities to work as a team, which can still be done so in a socially distanced way. And the teacher said, you've got to work on this topic and I want everyone in your team has to understand it. I come over and I have to, I, I need to be able to ask any of the group to, to get, you all have to be able to get the answer correct, bits of the answer. Um, and if you do, then you as a team get a reward. Um, so that's a cooperation that um, helps children work better together with people they might not otherwise get on with because they're, they're cooperating for a purpose. And then also, I think sometimes it's, okay to acknowledge that not all children are the huggy friendly work best that way some of them want to some of them are the people who are going to watch top gear and things like that when they're older and they'll want competition um so i think we need to allow that to happen as well and um so i think that balance can be useful yeah okay thank you for that mark wants to add something i was just thinking while you david were talking as well um, in terms of workload, what we didn't get to cover, Mark, with you was your view of marking, which is mainly where you walk around writing on people's books, I agree. But there is a blog, whether Nina has a chance to find that or not, that you wrote for us about. It, it's sort of a version of the lazy teaching idea that we, 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 we sort of put forward at secondary level, but you're the version of that in secondary, in primary, really, which is how much of the stuff can I sort of, in terms of my workload, can I pass over to them in a way that they benefit and I benefit as well. But but so that maybe that's maybe Nina will be able to find that. But basically, marking involves writing. I agree because you are sharing with them the mark scheme and what they're looking for, and it ties in with some of Jonathan's work as well around um, peer critique and peer review. Um, but maybe we can look at that some other time or whatever in terms of workload. But Mark, what did you want to say with regard to David? And then we've got three minutes, and, and maybe we'll... I was just going to say very quickly. I, I also like um, if you, if it depends on the school you teach in, but if you teach in a school that does weekly spelling tests or weekly times table tests, a really good way is to combine both of what David's said and it's actually you, the children collaborate and what you do is they're in a pair and they have to work on the spellings over the course of the week and they've numbered themselves one and two and at the end of the week um, you pick a number, number one, and it's that person that's then responsible for the pair's um, spelling score or the pairs times table score and actually you see that they've invested in it and what you point out to them is yes I might have picked number one and at the start of the week they were the least confident but the reality is is you failed not them because actually you haven't helped them get there and it's a, it is a really really powerful tool because actually the children then have a real investment in the collaboration as well as giving them the competitive the competitive element and I did that at the the first school the uh, independent school where I was told by the head teacher it will never work and it won't catch on and and before i left everybody was doing it that way i love that i, I forgot i used to, yeah i used to talk about something like that you know to get them to revise in pairs and then toss a coin whoever loses the, the toss sits the test but they both share the mark exactly it really it really focuses them in yeah no i like that and and being told you have been told it, it won't work here um but it clearly did jonathan do you want to uh, fingers crossed finish your story well, I, no, I haven't got time. Uh, I haven't got time, but it's all right because it's in my book. Uh, it's in my book, Monkey Proof Box. Um, but what I will say, just based on that, I suppose, and the whole independence thing and how you might um, kind of rebalance the classroom in a way, um, I want to say, first of all, I agree wholeheartedly with what Will said in terms of routine. I think as a, as a newly qualified teacher, routines are your best friend. Um, I think there's the risk inherent with routines is that they can, they can be taken to an extreme so that you get that cut so regimented an approach that like I say those children become almost entirely dependent um, and so I suppose a, a question to to ask yourselves is that sense of you know to, to what extent are the routines and systems within my classroom um, to do with the kids or to do with me um, is it about me making my life easier um, or is it for the benefit of those children um, and and the answers to those questions should should result in in lots of routines being maintained and then others maybe yeah oh well, almost there almost there oh, <laughs> but some being maintained and others being reviewed and being looked at again and uh, yeah i think that's that's right at the heart of Thank you, Jonathan. We almost got there. Right at the heart of so many of the decisions you make is, is, is this going to, is this 
for the children? Is it for their learning? Is that what this is for? And if it is, then we could do, we'll do more of it. And if it's not, we need to review it and think about it again. It's half nine in my world, half eight in your world, wherever you are. Um, it's always such a pleasure to be, to spend any time with any of the independent thinking associates. So um, uh, David and Mark and Jonathan and Nina again, and Will, thank you for your, for your wisdom, for your insights, for your honesty, for your time, especially if it's half term. Um, uh, for all the delegates who, who have been here for the, uh, for the 90 minutes, thank you for that. Thank you for your questions. Um, they've been really useful. If there's any that you really wanted answering or you, want, or you think of you know, tonight when you go away thinking about this, Ian at independentthinking.co.uk, drop me an email and, uh, uh, and we'll do our best. Um, the Crown House, um, say sponsoring this, 30% off NQT30 on their website, I mean, let's put the information in. Any of the books by the people here are a, are, a, are, are a good and worthwhile read as an NQT and will become part of how you, who you are as a teacher because they're, they're, they're that's important. On that note, time for me to go and get some tea. Um, stay safe, good luck, thank you very much and see you again. Bye.